Hello, Warlords and Generals. My name is Tabhammer, and welcome to a, a lore video. I will be covering both Age of Sigmar and Warhammer 40k. Today we will be covering the Realm of Chaos and Warhammer 40k. Very distinctly from Age of Sigmar's because there's just enough difference that I feel like covering them both separately will help people distinguish the two and how they interact with said universes. With that said, let's begin. To quote, Every moment of anger, hate, pain, suffering, pleasure, desire, and deceit is mirrored in the war powers of chaos. When its legions march, they march to return upon us a ruin that is of our own making. Unquote. Aaron L. Ar Eldar Farseer. Chaos is the manifestation of all conscious and subconscious thought in the galaxy owed to cruel and vicious gods and their servants the demons that are fragments of them, and insane renegades, as well as madman devotees that make their home in the immaterium. However, some species do not contribute to the warp's overall consciousness, such as the Tau, the Necrons, and the Tyranids. In the Tau's case, they just do not have enough of a psychic presence. The Necrons are abhorred to everything that is the immaterium, and the Tyranids are so alien that they aren't even part of the warp their psychic powers instead coming from their hive mind, the overall collective controlling brain of the Tyranid Swarm. Of all the warp entities that make their home in the realm of chaos, four in particular stick out, for they are the gods of chaos. They are Korn, god of slaughter, Nurgle, god of plagues, Zinch, the changer, and the god of lies and magic, and then Slanesh, the god of all excess pleasure and pain. These four are in a constant struggle against each other called the Great Game, where one, where all of them are constantly in vying for control over the other and gaining more power than the other. All of them are in constant flow and flux of power and gaining more and less than the other three. None is greater than the other at any given time. Only in rare moments is one ascended compared to the other three. I am aware that was a very brief introduction to the four major players within the warp, however I will be doing v longer videos on each of them, for each of them is a very rich character and part of the 40k universe that I feel would be a detriment to both storytelling and uh, filling you in on the lore if I were to cover them here and just brush over them really quickly. So later videos they will be covered. The Warp, or the Immaterium as it's also known as, is a very dangerous and volatile place that only chaotic renegade space marines and demons can navigate properly. However, and unfortunately for the Imperium, it is the most effective way to uh, traverse the universe for it is also the quickest way. If it were not, the Imperium as a whole would collapse, for it would not be able to give it reinforcements and supplies to the far-flung worlds of its very vast and large empire. The Emperor's Soul, which is also known as the Astronomicon, is the only thing that keeps the ships of the Imperium safe through the warp, for it is a guiding light, almost as a lighthouse of science fiction. It guides the ships to their destination and keeps them safe from the predations of demons and other warp entities. Geller fields are also important in this matter, for they are engines specifically designed to keep demons out of ships as they transition in and out of the warp. The warp is also how human psychers come to be into existence, made through the process and manner it happens. Seems random at best, for there is no consistent way on how to make a psyker out of a human being. It's simply that one is just born, or one just has it manifest randomly. This has both been a blessing and a curse for the Imperium, for psychers are powerful weapons, and are the entire reason the Emperor can still function on the Golden Throne. For a black ship carries 10,000 psychers to him every day to keep his psychic presence maintained within the warp, so it does not falter. However, this this problem is only getting worse for the Astronomicon is still shrinking regardless of how many black ships. And with the Secretary's Maledictum opening up, the black ships are coming in less and less and more psychers are being stranded on worlds. And this causes another danger. 
for an untrained and untapped psyker can be the gateway for demons. A demon can prey upon an unsuspecting psyker and cause them to become a manifestation of said demon that has preyed upon them. Though the psychers are, like I said, a blessing too, for they are very powerful weapons against demons as well as being the man their reason for manifestations. The Grey Knights, for example, are the greatest demon fighting force that the Imperium has to offer, and they are all, every single one of them, a psyker. I will go more into Grey Knights in another video. For now, I am simply bringing them up to show that psychers are both good and bad. There are also things known as warp rifts, which are gigantic coalesced energy of the warp. When enough psychic energy is within an area, suddenly it'll cause a giant rift and tear the veil between the real space and the warp, causing demons to pour in very temporarily, but much more easily, for a warp storm is never permanent. It may last a few days to a week to several years, to some even lasting centuries before they finally dissipate, leaving the worlds that they've ravaged completely desolate or sucked back into the warp to become demon worlds, their inhabitants suffering a fate much worse than death. The warp is home to not just warp entities, the chaos gods, and their demonic servants, but it is also home to renegade space marine chapters and the nine traitor legions that fell to chaos during the Horus heresy. Nine of them once create, once fought for the emperor during the great crusade, each led by a primarch created as an emperor's son and as a great weapon of war, both in combat and in leading their men to total victory, betrayed the emperor for various different reasons. Amongst the greatest to fall was Horus Lupercal. He was the leader of the Luna Wolves, but due to being the favorite son and the greatest among Primarchs, he had his legion be able to renamed to the Sons of Horus and was renamed Warmaster when the Emperor let, uh, backed out of the Great Crusade to work on a secret project which would be later be revealed as the Webway Project for Humanity. Various uh, events occurred. Horus fell to chaos, and he caused eight other legions to follow with him into damnation. As he, as the Siege of Terror continued, he made a gamble to lower his shields, which allowed the Emperor to challenge his son face to face, slaying Horus in one-on-one -on -one combat and obliterating his soul, making it so that Horus could never be used as a puppet of the Chaos Gods again. It broke the back of the siege, and all the traitors fled. The, the sons of Horus attempting to keep the corpse of their sire, yet they failed. And yet, after a while, they sought out Abaddon, Horus's favored son, who decided to reinvigorate his legion, collect his brothers, and destroy the remains of Horus so that it could not be cloned and used by other legion's means. After destroying Horus's remains, Abaddon took full control of what was left of the Sons of Horus, but he made a decree. They would all paint their armor black and be called the Black Legion from then on, forever wearing the disgrace of failure that they've suffered throughout the centuries and suffer their hatred upon the Imperium wide as it was. Once again, that was a very brief overlay of events that occurred and led to the current 40k timeline. I will go over these details again in greater detail for now. We shall continue on with brief descriptions of the other nine traitor legions, starting with the Iron Warriors. Embittered at their treatment at the hands of the Emperor, they betrayed him simply because they felt they weren't being rewarded enough for their efforts during the Great Crusade. Having a bitter rivalry with the Imperial Fist for siege warfare, they are masters of siege, able to destroy any fortress they come across, and this is something they love to prove to the Imperial over and over and over again. Of the legions, they are the ones that rely the most on demon engines, and even create new ones constantly. Reports say that 15 new versions of demon engines have been spotted recently after the Secretrix Maledictum's opening, causing new waves of terror and way worse thoughts on what the Iron Warriors are capable of. The Word Bearers. Those that cause Horus and all the other nine to fall to chaos to begin with. 
their Primarch Lorgar is often credited for being the first heretic, for he was a man of great spiritual promenade. And the Emperor uh, basically punished him for being a man of such great faith that he saw the Emperor as a god. And it just got to such great lengths that the Emperor chastised him by destroying one of his greatest cities and telling him to stop the worship of the Emperor as a god, for it went against the Imperial Creed and the Emperor's beliefs. This caused Lorgar to fall to chaos and start worshipping gods that would want his worship, and this poison seeped to the rest of the chaos legions, causing them to fall. So the word bearers are the most fanatical of all the traitor legions, and the most insidious threat to the Imperium. For what is greater and more insidious than twisting the fate faithful against the Emperor himself? especially since Lorgar is penned with creating the Imperial Creed, a truth that breaks the mind and will of the most Imperial Cardinals that discover the truths of it. And that is the nature of the word bearers, to break the spirit of the Imperium, to cause them even more to fall to chaos, and join their cause to overthrow the Imperium that once denounced their faith. The Night Lords are masters at terror warfare. Leaving lightning strikes into enemy territory, Flaying any they can to decrease morale so that they can soften up their targets and make it much, much easier to get supplies and raid upon them. They are pirates more so than any other of the traitor legions, believing that relying too much on the demons and being too faithful to chaos makes you weak and pathetic, showing grand contempt for the other nine traitor legions in any of the renegade chapters that rely too much on the demonic powers. This, however, does not mean that the Night Lords do not rely on the powers of chaos, for they use demons, warp talons, hell drakes to cause lightning strikes to make terror so even quicker amongst the ranks of the enemy, making it so that they can soften them up and just butcher straight through them with ease later. The Alpha Legion, the one of the nine traitor legions that is the least known about, but is the most memed upon of them, and that is a joke, of course, for their loyalties have always been uh, scrupulous at best. They, f they function off subtlety, misdirection. They're basically the worst legion to fight because they will not fight you straightforward. They will, f they will lead you somewhere and then attack you from behind or cause you to explode from underneath. Their masters and primarchs, which, unique amongst the primarchs, had were twins, Alpharius and Omegon, which were about the size of a normal marine, so when they were in their full power armor, could actually be convincingly other space marines. It is also noteworthy that which one is Alpharius and which one is Omegon takes very vast levels of detection and observation skills to actually deter when they are standing next to each other, for they are the masters of trickery, subterfuge, and deception. The Thousand Sons, who are the sorceress and psychically most gifted amongst all the, all the legions of the Great Crusade, their sire, Magnus the Red, was the most psychically gifted and the only prominently gifted in psychic warfare. He constantly made efforts to make psychers not, out not to be great threats to the Imperium being that he understood exactly what the Emperor was like, being the psychically powerful entity himself. However, this arrogance did eventually lead to his downfall and to the ruination of the Webway Project and the Thousand Sons to go to the traitors when the Space Wolves were sent to destroy Prospero due to deceit. And in the Thousand Sons, most of them were psychers, but also they suffered from the... the Mutation known the Curse of Flesh, which caused the Battle Brothers, less psychically attuned, to become horrific mutated monsters. After the Horus Heresy, this got really out of control, to which Ariman, Magnus's right hand, caught, went to a spell called the Rubric of Ariman, which would help his Battle Brothers never suffer from the mutation again. The spell went out of control, and it caught, and it led to Magnus to actually dispel the spell, for it caused 
sections around the planet that it was being cast on to be involved in warp storm and even demons to flee from its power. And after the spell wore off, all those who were psychically mighty were gifted with even greater gifts of sorcery and magic. However, those who had no psychic gift or little were caused to become dust and sealed inside their rubric armor, forever to never be able to be mutated once again, but be suffering a fate worse than death. The Death Guard, sons of the Primarch Mortarian, they were no noted for their resilience even among space marines to fight in the worst conditions possible, for they had grander resilience to poisons and diseases than any other space marine, and they were always on the edges and the fringe of the universe fighting their way. Due to circumstances with Mortarian's uh, quote-unquote rescue from his world, he hates the Emperor for not allowing him to either fight his his foster father fairly or to die in combat. For Mortarian represented the Emperor's stubbornness if anything else. Mortarian fell because he believed that the Emperor was a tyrant and nothing more, and that is what Mortarian hated the most, tyrants, for they were the reason his home world was barbarous, was such an awful place to live. Though it was, however, his first captain, Typhus, which caused him to fall to chaos. Typhus was always a secret worshipper of Nurgle, and Mortarian had always hated the psychically gifted, so Typhus had some sort of contempt towards his master. And when they were making transition to Terra during the Horus Heresy, Typhus secretly killed all the Astronomicons and uh, those psychically gifted that could uh, pilot the ships through the warp and said that he could do it himself, so Mortarian agreed. However, this led the entire Death Guard Legion into a trap, into the space of Nurgle's realm in the warp. So uh, Nurgle infected every single one of them, and due to their resilient bodies, the normal effects of Nurgle's gifts was amplified for that they could not die, and they were suffering even greater. And it got to the point where Mortarian sold his soul and his entire Legion's soul simply so that it would end, and it was then that the Death Guard were reborn as Nurgle's favored sons. The Emperor's children, Fulgrim, the Primarch, known also as the Phenotian, when he was discovered and took command of his legion, it was in very small numbers, I believe, only about 400 to 1,000 left in the legion overall, and he gave such a rousing speech that the Emperor allowed him to rename his legion the Emperor's children, and it was allowed the only honor to uh, bear the mark of the Aquila, the Emperor's personal sigil, into battle as the legion's symbol. They fought with perfection and they sought it at all times. What led this legion's fall, however, was when Fulgrim picked up the demonic blade of Lair, which was contained within it a demon of Slanesh. And eventually, due to circumstances, the demon slowly possessed Fulgrim and in which, during a horrific tragedy, which would kick off the Horus Heresy as the Isfahan V drop massacre, Fulgrim slew his greatest brother, Ferris Manus, by decapitating him. At this point, he fell into such a great depression that he allowed the demon to take over. And in this state, Fulgrim learned a lot about demons and eventually took over his body. And in this, he learned a lot about Slanesh and sought Slanesh out for Slanesh to him now was perfection, and eventually he, he was the first Primarch to achieve apotheosis and become a demon prince, the first demon Primarch. And at the Siege of Terra, Fulgrim's job was to uh, harass the citizenship so that A, they could keep the demons on Terra longer, and B, to try to distract some of the defending forces to come save the citizenship. Now the Emperor's children are a twisted mockery of what they used to be, only serving to their pleasures in excess and serving Slanesh, the prince of all pleasures. The world eaters, those that worship corn, their sire Angron never stood a chance in not being a Canaan's worshipper, unfortunately, for the world that he was stuck on simply was a gladiatorial one. He was thrown in the pits and eventually given an ancient device known as the Butcher's Nails, which was a arcano tech, which was these 
humming nails attached to a device which would be put into your brain which would inhibit all emotion except rage and bloodthirst and when you weren't killing it would cause you immense pain so the only time Angron felt any happiness was in the midst of slaughter this caused him to be a very hateful and angry individual when he was on his planet and he was leading his revolt the emperor came and rescued him and him alone leading his brothers and sisters to die in battle not helping him this caused Angron to become even more bitter towards the emperor not allowing him to die in battle nor helping him to conquer his world this also led to Angron hating his sons for they reflected the imperium and he eventually came to accept them due to Karn's actions and he implemented the butcher's nails in all of them during the events of the shadow crusade Lorgar forced Angron into apotheosis so that he could save him from the butcher's nails now whether this helped or worsened Angron's case is unclear only Angron knows and I think he's too angry to tell you in general at the siege of Terra he's the one that constantly led assaults into the palace never fully re breaching it for being a demon now means he couldn't breach the Emperor's barrier and when they fled the the warband the Legion broke into warbands due to Karn's actions and now they are just many roving ravagers of rage ever hating their Primarch for what they did to them and causing the Legion to fall to become Korn's favorite slaughterers and the legions are not the only chaos warbands in the warp and the immaterium other notable renegades are the purge the crimson slaughters the red corsairs and many many others they all they all fell after the horus heresy but that doesn't mean they're any less of a threat for the being smaller means they're less detectable meaning they can commit to raids among the imperium greater than the legions even can now this is 40k we have been going over a lot of grim dark stuff and i understand that it is part of the setting but let's go over the kind of beneficial sides to the war for it's not all demon slaughter and all that there are some beneficial entities in the warp the emperor is believed to be a beneficial entity within the warp for who else is allowing a mankind to transit to the warp safely and without being corrupted and killed by demons there's also cases of living saints, which are believed to be blessings of the emperor. Celestine is a really good example of this. She comes whenever the Imperium is at its dire need. Also, due to the Secretrix Maledictum, Chaos Magic has skyrocketed, but also have Acts of Faith, Blinding Light, Pillars of Flame, men being able to be healed from their wounds that would have let them maim for all their lives all of which are manifestations of the faithful in the Imperium. And this section will be significantly smaller than that of the evil side because chaos does represent all the nasty stuff coalesced into, into like singular things, slaughter, deceit, rage, all that. Uh, but like there are other entities that are beneficial to the Imperium. For example, the Sanguinor for the Blood Angels is believed to be an incarnation of Sanguinus' uh, subconscious, and he shows up whenever the Blood Angels are in dire need of his assistance, though his actual origin and entity believes that he is the reincarnation of a previous Blood Angel warrior, or he could be the subconscious of Sanguinus. It is not entirely sure. All that is known is he is a warp entity that appears when most needed. The warp is a critical aspect to the storytelling of Warhammer, for chaos is only the other side of reality. It is the coin it is the other side of the coin when it comes to this story this world's realistic storytelling. And it is both in ascendance on both sides of the faithful to the Imperium and the faithful to chaos. I just simply hope Games Workshop does a good job in uh pushing the plot forward without having to commit to an end time such as they did with Warhammer Fantasy Battles. That would be very tragic because Warhammer 40k has such a rich lore and it would be such a shame to let it all go up in smoke like that. But my name is Tavhammer. This has been uh, an introduction to chaos. Please leave a comment if you like this or if you have any commentary in general. Uh, like if you want to see more from me and subscribe if you want to see even more from me. Thank you, have a nice day, and have fun wargaming.